You're watching The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG, an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original, non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. If you like what you see, please consider pledging to our Patreon to support the show and get access to a patron-only after-show, early podcast episodes, GM notes, character sheets, and even the chance for your tabletop OC to cameo in our series. Thank you so much for watching, and enjoy! The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for this episode may include death of loved ones, grief, romance, flirting, complex and complicated relationships, monsters, monstrosity, curses, poison, blizzards, snow, falling, fantasy violence, descriptions of food, and references to loss of children and claustrophobia. Arc 1 Interlude the First Mission, Part 1 Two months before the Chosen One dies. Two months before anyone knows what grief is to come. Before anyone realizes what loss must be endured. Before anyone understands what love is to be had and lost. The Transplaner Reification and Nourishment Syndicate gains a brand new strike team. Dawn breaks. This morning is the same as any other in meta-dimensional space. The sunlight feels as new as it does every single day of the journey, just slightly to the left. Business hums along. The Syndicate thrums like a living creature, corridors overburdened with agents, heroes, survivors. Viewing bays reveal sweeping vistas of worlds captured in memory. Deserts, forests, the dark tides of space, the bright surfaces of suns. Trans is alive with activity and warmth. In short, it's a typical day at the Syndicate. They say that if you walk far enough, you can find the edges of trans, where the environment peters out into a broad expanse of, well, no one really knows what. No one's made it that far. Yet. But we do know that before the Syndicate comes to an end, you will find nourishers. We push past research labs cloaked in bright shadow, past a rainy train station packed with agents, past a hot spring nestled in snowy hills to find farmland. A thousand acres of rolling fields glisten under a pair of suns, one blue, one pink, under a bright white sky. Birds flutter from tree to tree, the neospring warp of greenhouses thunders against a stiff breeze. Community members kneel in the dirt, weeding, planting, watering. We pull in on one such person now, Zynan Esh. The poster boy of the lone survivor support group, knee-deep in soil and contemplation. Who are you? What do you look like? And what are you pressing into the dirt? Zynan Esh is a not notably overly tall or short man who is about right in size, and that's it. He is not truly capable of uh, expressing any sort of reality to himself because he is more thinking about the dirt. But when you look at him, you see he is a man with two legs, two arms, dusty, purple skin. He is, he has shape. He might. He holds in his hand, though, his dirt-covered, muddy hands, uh, a very small uh, sprout not uh, fully grown, but past the seeding. And it is getting laid into a field where he has laid three more that are sitting perfectly in a row. Uh, and he dusts off his hands as he uh, lets go and it stays perfectly upright, supported in the soil. Mm. 
You smell fresh dirt, sun-baked skin, your own sweat rolling down the side of your cheek as you press your fingers into the earth and do this simple but literally grounding and metaphorically grounding work. And I think your contemplation is interrupted somewhat by the approach of hooves and a slight shaking of the ground. As Kenzo Hirose, one of your friends, friend being an interesting word here for you, Zainan, but he at the very least would consider himself one of your friends. Kenzo Hirose approaches and we see a lean but muscular older centaur man. His light brown skin is deeply tanned on the face, the neck, the forearms, a classic farmer's tan. And he wears a short sleeve shirt and a wide brimmed straw hat over straight black hair that's tied in a top knot that disappears under the brim of the hat. His lower half resembles a sika deer with rich chestnut fur, these spatterings of white dots and a small rounded tail at the end and a colorful Irazumi hikai covers his entire left arm from the tips of his fingers all the way to the pectoral muscle of his chest. It depicts a demon being drowned in waves and waves and waves of some crimson liquid surrounded by gorgeous flowers and blossoms. And as Kenzo approaches, he lets out a, a kind of a greeting noise and waves his right hand in introduction. Zainan, how's the planting coming along? Zainan dusts himself off the rest of the way and starts to stand up, uh, happy that Kenzo lets him take up this space in his field. This is not Zainan's job. And he is all smiles to greet what is probably one of his closer associates, acquaintances. Uh, and he straightens himself up dons his black flat-brimmed hat. Uh, Kenzo, I think I got most of this palette done. It's looking good. You know, you've got quite the green thumb, even if you insist on rejecting my compliments every time. And I have to ask again, every time, who taught you how to do that? You know, we all get it from somewhere. That's true, that's true. I gotta tell you, you know, when I retired and I first set off taking care of this patch of land as part of my com ops assignment, I thought to myself, there's no way I can breathe any kind of life out of this flat plane of earth. But now look at this place, bristling with life, humming with activity. <laughs> Even the young agents like to come and stroll around here, see what they might do when they retire. So you don't need my secrets. Ah. Keep your secret, Zyna Nash. I'll dig him out of you someday. Keep digging. <laughs> I, uh, gotta start heading back in a little bit, but, uh, wouldn't mind having to sit with you for a little while, maybe cool off? Of course not. Over there, shade of that sycamore. You know, I'm there. And you walk side by side with Kenzo to a nice shaded area by a tall, proud sycamore tree. You take off a load. Kenzo also kind of gets down on his uh, hooves, bending his legs down and taking his hat off to reveal that top knot and resting it onto the dirt next to where your legs are. Ah, oh, it's a good day, Zainan. It's a good day. Got a lot of planting done, a lot of weeding done. And, uh, how about you? Have you, uh, gotten a lot of planting done? Outside of this, uh, farmland, I mean. Hmm. You know, I do the same thing. Mission, come home, LSSG. Come and mess with your garden a little. Repeat. Hmm. Yeah, it's a nice rhythm to fall into. You know, one day, when you're ready, if you're ready. No, no. When you're ready, I'd really like to see you here, full time. When the hand of fate that I serve stops needing me, then I will maybe change my calling. Until then, I know where I belong. <laughs> Selfless as always, Ash. Selfless as always. <laughs> but what about what you want? That's important too, you know. 
This is good enough for me. All right. If you say so. You know, you're getting reassigned soon. Another strike team needs their guiding light. But hmm. it's important that that guiding light is uh, taken care of as well. How are you holding up, Zion? And how are you really holding up? Kenzo always dances right close to the line of saying the right thing with Zynan, and this is no exception. Zynan wants to open his mouth and say more, but he just doesn't have it in him. The door is still closed, and he just smiles. I'm doing all right. I, between things, in a lot of ways. Strike mm. teams, beds. <laughs> we'll get there. Right, right, right. Uh, well, about that. And Kenzo reaches into uh, some pouches that he has strapped around his waist, and he pulls out a pristinely written letter, sealed Where... in an envelope with a wax stamp. Where did you get that? He gave it to me. Where else? Uh... Here. You better take it. I can't have both of you breathing down my necks about this. I'm done being a middleman. Fine. Fine. And he takes it. He can feel that familiar paper, that fine quality to it. The texture of it, the dimension of nice thick parchment. He doesn't look at it. In fact, looking at it is actually more than he can bear, and his slightly still dirty fingers just hold it before he unceremoniously tucks it into his jacket, knowing that there is easily a breast pocket for it. You're gonna uh, read that sooner than later, right? Naeem seemed quite insistent on you doing that. I'll get there. I don't want you to feel like you have to... All you gotta say is yes, Zynan. That's all I need to hear. I will read it, Kenzo. I promise. Uh, I just gotta mm. find the right moment. Uh, but I think right now is not it, because I have to go to a meeting for said A meeting, team. right. Right. Yep, yep, mm. yep. Of course. Timing's always off. You always have something to do. But just remember, Zion, if you keep waiting for the right moment, you'll never actually get started. Naeem's not going anywhere. And, uh, whatever he has to say can wait. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Kenzo lets out a kind of horse-like snort at that, <clears throat> uh, but doesn't say much else about it. Paws his front hooves against the ground, stomps it, stomps at the soil, and then lifts himself up. All right, whatever you say, Zynan. Hey, these acres are always open to you whenever you need a breather, Whenever you want to help me uh, take a load off my back. You tend it beautifully, and I think it might be one of the most comforting places in the multiverse. <laughs> and he stands up, straightens himself out a little bit. Why, thank you, Ash. But don't forget, all of this land isn't just me. Dozens of people, hundreds of hands if you count everyone that passes through here, everyone that has any contribution to making this place beautiful are needed to make this place function. It's just like uh, an individual, one might say. No one man is an island, as they say. <laughs> uh, well... I appreciate all the many people, the lives, and the heart that goes into making this place, but my hands my heart belong out in the field. And I will see you when I'm next back at the Syndicate. Alright, see you when I see you then. But uh, hey, if and when your heart ever decides to not belong in that field anymore and come to this field, door's wide open. Very funny. And Simon <laughs> keeps walking. Yeah, and I think as your eyes flick toward the horizon, as your boots carry you toward your next faithful meeting, we pan up to the twin suns that hang over Kenzo's plot of farmland. 
and we fall down onto a streak of wild white hair. Training equipment lines the walls. High-tech implements standing next to good old iron and sandbags. Agents sweat bullets, sparring in sand pits, lifting inordinate amounts of weights, stretching from toe to toe, partaking in all manner of training. The sound of singing metal rings through the hall as a pink longsword falls against curved silver steel and we push through the surrounding agents to find a private corner that many glance at, but none dare approach. For the Chosen One is busy training in preparation for her first ever mission. Sayer's also there. So Sayer, who are you? What do you look like? And what maneuver are you and your sister practicing in this sweat-stained training hall? Sayer is a dark-skinned, antlered young man with shaggy black hair that is glistening with sweat that is tussled messily across his head. He wears these dangly dagger earrings in the shape of a goddess with bright blue eyes fixated on the young woman in front of him, his sister, his other half, the chosen one of fate. And he's also there. He's wearing the standard tran uh, trans uniform of uh, whites with black and gold uh, jacket draped over it. And it is, he is currently in a interesting position. He has lowered himself a little bit to catch the blade partially with his moon sickles. These very simple, practically made sickles with a curved blade and leather wraps. And as he meets his sister's blade in his crescent blade, these twins are practicing a new combo move that they haven't quite nailed yet. But once they both listen to the hearts of one another, there's nothing these two can't achieve. And as soon as the blades make contact, Slayer lowers himself to a knee and doesn't yell doesn't call, just gently whispers to his sister. My thigh and your foot now. And what he will do is lower his thigh just enough to act as a step stool for his sister to hop up and be launched upwards by his leg and his arms so that she can use mm. an upper, an uppercut attack with her long sword. Yeah, your sister steps onto your thigh and even though it looks like she's exerting no effort at all, you feel force ribbon against your knee, like the graviturgic force of a black hole collapsing it on itself, and poof, she springs her way up, longsword uh, thrust in the direction of the air. She does like several somersaults in the air, very graceful, extremely beautiful. And when she falls down, her hair ripples like a beautiful white cape behind her. Mm -hmm. And she cracks the floor with like the force of her landing and the down cut of her long sword. Sayer arrives maybe half of a heartbeat later, but he is uh, right by her side, sprinting across the field, mainly focusing on the destination that he's estimating of her trajectory. But as he stops short, he kind of slides in, takes, takes a look at a clock on the wall, and then back up to sing at the crack at the bottom. And he says, I need to be faster on that draw. But I guess. <sighs> Sing lets out a big exhale of effort. She straightens up and kind of like combs her hand through her hair to like wick the sweat uh, and the white out of her eyes and reveals these bright, impossibly bright, fateful pink eyes set in dark brown skin, just like yours and a face that is glowing, literally, and in every other sense of the word. She draws attention. She feels important. She's dressed in the same black, gold, and slight bits of white robe of the trans uniform, just like you. And as she rolls her shoulders back, a kind of roguish smile is uh, cocked at the sides of her lips. Oh, yes, yes, just a little bit faster, just a little bit more quick on the draw, but that was close, Sayir. Really, really, really close. It's like 99% really there. 
Yeah, do you need to be higher? Do you need more time to uh, get more air time? Mm, yeah, yeah, let's 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 try launching me just up a little bit higher, and then yeah. I think my draw can come out at the same time, you know? Instead mm. of like a one, two, I'm thinking like a one, two, three, we go up, yeah? Yeah, yeah that works. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take my mark back here. All right, let's pretend there's like all kinds of monsters and baddies surrounding us. <laughs> Nothing will stop me from launching you, don't you worry. Uh, and he will hold out his crescent blades like claws and he will prepare and meet his sister once more to try that maneuver and be quicker on the draw. Uh, but this time he taps into something deeper inside him and we finally see the black sun tattoo that is on his chest. It is like a ha like a dark halo shattering his, uh, his pectoral muscles. And it just, it almost looks like it pulses a little bit as he lightly taps into that primality, that strength, so he can launch his sister upward. And he does the same maneuver, runs forward, prepares his crescent blade to hook onto the long sword for safety, and lowers his knee just enough to launch her. One, two, three! And as Sing poosh, repels up into the air, the mouth of her robe uh, billows open, and we see that same tattoo over the same part of her chest, birthmark, omen, whatever it is, but the colors are inverted. Instead of a dark hole, it's a bright, open gasp toward a hopeful future. And she apexes into the air and then plummets back down, hits the ground, causes the crater to crater out even wider and deeper than before, and she springs back up to her feet. Ah, oh, that was it! We did it! That felt great! Amazing. That felt great! Did that feel good to you? It felt amazing. We were, we were as usual, in sync. Uh, and he raises Oh my god! Hand. Yes, 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 yes! And Sing, like, runs forward and, like, smacks her hand in, like, the most resounding high five ever. Like, it, like, <laughs> the sound of it reverberates through the training hall. <laughs> oh, we're, I think we're ready. <laughs> we're not just ready, we're gonna, like, blow minds. We are so prepared to get our first mission assignment. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited, I'm so ready, I just know we're gonna be, you and me, on the same strike team. I wonder on what our same... first mission's gonna be. Do you know who else is with us? No, no idea. We're gonna meet them today, though. I mean, I got the a notification on, you know, our hall oracle. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited. Finally, a real. Ooh, name. I wonder what our strike team's gonna be named. I hope we get to name it. You know, I don't actually know how mm. naming conventions work. I assume they get assigned to us, but if we don't like it, I think we can rename it, or maybe we name it ourselves. Whatever it is, I want to be able to name it with you, and with the rest <laughs> of our team, I suppose. Ooh, I just can't wait. <laughs> Sayer laughs, and this is young boyish laugh that escapes his lip, his lips, uh, despite the stature of a extremely muscular, hardened man. And he kind of wraps his arm around Sing, and uh, playfully, uh, kind of like plays with her hair, like right by the right side of their face, and they just say, "Yeah, what was it that you were doing a couple nights ago? I think." A certain someone was uh, reciting all the different strike team names in front of the mirror and seeing how hey, cool they sound. Say here! <laughs> and she like shoves you playfully away. Just uh, don't tell anyone about that, okay? It's a little embarrassing. But also, if you wanted to, like to maybe like get some opinions, like maybe we could do like a survey of what the coolest sounding names are, and then we could like riff off of them and sound like extra cool. Because like the Twilight Guard is fine, right? Super super dope, like whatever, like super mm -hmm. classic. But like, what if we were like the moon dark scions I... no okay i'll workshop it i'll workshop it i'll workshop it maybe scions isn't like the right too word. many words too many words yeah that's a little too many okay cool 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 hmm what about the like... revenge takers are we taking revenge i don't know maybe you could if like something bad happened to us i don't know <laughs> No, nothing bad will happen to us. <sighs> okay, I'll make sure fine. of it. Uh, ooh, ooh, what about? And interrupting this conversation, both of you hear a voice coming from the edge of the training area. Oops, sing. And you. I, I have a uh, update for you. And approaching the two of you is 
Cove, who is very butch, very tall. She is, as always, donned in this intricate black armor and has short, cropped, straight black hair and these piercing emerald green eyes. Both of you recognize Cove as a member of Strike Team Phoenix, who is a relatively new Strike Team, but they're already making a lot of waves at Trans. They're rising high in the leaderboard already. And obviously, Sayer, you know Cove because Cove has always kind of stuck around your sister right for years now and it's mm. an open secret that cove maybe has a thing for her and in terms of how cove feels about you well let's just hear it from cove's mouth herself hey sayer um okay i guess i have to deliver this to both of you now i was hoping to just catch sing but whatever i guess you're always sticking to her like a shadow uh your assignment is ready hand artemis has summoned you Sayer doesn't look at Cove. I like to imagine that he has his back turned to Cove and just tilts his head on the other side to just to glance a single eye over to Cove's emerald gaze. And all he can measure out is a grunt. Hmm. I go where my sister needs me. And I go where my strike team needs me. You ready, Sing? And the demeanor uh, yes. immediately shifts. Yeah, Sing just like, like claps her hands together very excited, like springs up, hops a little bit, says, oh, thank you, Cove, come on, Sarah, let's go, let's go, let's go, our mission, ah, our strike team, ah. And she like twirls around, <laughs> like literally flies up into the air like seven feet and lands gracefully back down and starts running off <laughs> outside of the train, training hall. And as you follow behind her with a laugh, Cove mutters at you on your way out. <clears throat> Trailing behind her like a dog is always Sayer isn't going to get you very far in life. But maybe that's what you're good for, picking up the scraps. Mm -hmm. And maybe all you're good for is to stare at the sun, wondering what it's like to feel its warm. Maybe that's all you're fated for. <sighs> and Cove can't think of rebuttal fast enough as you exit. But as soon as you're out of earshot, she goes, yeah, yeah, but takes one, no one. Fuck. And then her eyes fall on a letter that has fluttered out of Singh's robes, unnoticed both by her and her brother, and that now lands at Cove's feet. She lets out a, uh, Sing, you... <sighs> but Singh's already out of earshot as well. She bends down and picks it up, and her eyebrows shoot up into her hairline as we see a letter with the symbol of the Twilight Guard stamped at the very top. And now, we follow close on the Chosen One's heels down corridors, through throngs of agents going about their business, and we pull into an office. But not just any office, a Hand of Fate's office. Lucy, the patron saint of monsters sits behind a desk carved from volcanic rock. She reclines in a chair made of ivory and bone, the hollow mouthed skulls of men comprising the armrests. Wooden pillars painted as red as blood, or maybe they are painted with blood, tower toward a ceiling of wooden ribs littered with the bone white flags of curse papers. Deep vestibules carry shrines to countless clashing gods, gods of beasts, gods of war, gods of pain, of sex, of death. Fat golden sices litter these shrines alongside precious gems, reams of rich silk, and decanters bursting with intoxicating wines. A vast stone mural depicts a beast with eight heads, each more terrible than the last holding sixteen deadly weapons in her hands. The limbs of this mural fan out behind Lucy's head like the inverted rays of some dark halo. And as always, 
Lucy wears a pristine three-piece suit. Their skin is the color of a deep bruise. Their shoulder-length black hair rakes past a pair of gold cuffed horns. Their eyes are black, pure black, like the void between stars with pinpricks of crimson forming the irises around lightless pupils. Lucy's desk is completely empty except for a chessboard in the death throes of an endgame. Across the desk from Lucy is you, Lumira. You sit in a surprisingly comfortable chair of bone, wood, and satin. After the incident, let's say, Lucy has called you into her office for a chat. That chat began and is now ending rather painfully with a game of chess. And Lucy had not yet revealed the discussion topic. She'd simply watched you play against her with those tactical, investigative red eyes. It's your turn, Lumira. Careful now. I'm two moves away from checkmate. Lumira, in her posture, in her face, it's what's new now, but that precision-like stare as she scans over each piece of the board. She looks like she's deep in thought, trying to figure out what her next move is. And she is, but from the waist down, it is nothing but nerves. You hear, she's trying to keep it from being so loud, but her right leg is shaking. And every now and then you hear the tap of her heel as it makes contact with the ground. As she tries to keep her leg up above and solid exterior up here, not attempting to show any face at all. Um, before she picks up one of the pieces and moves two steps over. Switches the board back around. Still hmm. making eye contact with Lucy. Interesting. And Lucy occasionally makes comments after you make a move, but it's only ever interesting or fascinating or Hmm, are you quite sure? Well, it's done. And this time, she examines the board for half a second before she moves a piece immediately. And something inside your chest drops a little as you see the checkmate close in. There's no other way around it. You're mated in one move. So how will you take it, Lumira? Your inevitable end. I take it as you've taught me, on the chin and continue pushing for another day. Hmm. Make your move. And Lumira, once she sees the move she made, in her head she's admonishing herself because she's seen exactly how she set herself up for it and is now chastising herself internally for even allowing that opening to be made on her in the first place. And she makes the only other move she can make at this point in time with checkmate being inevitable and moves it over directly in front of Lucy's piece where she can knock it over in relation to checkmate. Yeah. Lucy watches you move your king forward, the smile widens slightly on her mouth, as she moves her knight uh, forward and knocks the king over. Checkmate. Well fought, Lumira. You know, I am genuinely very impressed by you. Very few people are able to take me into the endgame. Most lose during the opening. I appreciate 
The fact that you think so highly of my intellectual abilities, Hand Lucy. Hmm. Well, of course I do. It's why you have served as an agent on one of my teams for so long. You have talent, Lumira. You have raw skill. You are cunning. You are powerful. But you lack control. And Lucy starts putting the pieces back into place. I think with every accolade Lucy was giving Lumera, her stature puffed up a bit more until her back was, which her posture is already impeccably straight. Her hands continuously steepled in front of her. She stands up, like sits up higher until you lack control and she just deflates just a little bit. Head down. It was a mistake that won't be made in the line again. I'm doing everything in my power to understand what it was that happened so that it will never happen again. I think it has something to do with not having enough of my stabilizing gum in the field I ran out. So I have been quadrupling the amount that I make and keep on hand from this point forward. It will never happen again. I'm sorry. Hmm. I believe you, Lumira. I believe you when you say that you are taking every action that you can to ensure that the same mistake is not repeated. And indeed it will not. Not under me. You are a prodigious healer, Lumira. But you are also fighting uphill against yourself. It's an odd contradiction. I've never quite seen anything like it before. As skilled and talented as you are at the healing arts, it's like you have to tap past some deep blockage within yourself to access it. You know, maybe one day you actually could beat me in a game. But I am in the business of winning. Victory. So I shall not teach you how to win against me. But someone else could. The one person who has ever even come close to beating me at chess. And Lucy. It's... And Lumira takes steps back a bit because she feels herself getting frantic. This is one mishap in countless Agent team Lumira, wins. Meet your end on the chin. Keep your head up. I am reassigning you. You are no longer a member of Strike Team Phoenix, and I am no longer your designated hand. Yes, ma'am. Who will I be reporting to? Hmm. Hand Artemis. The briefing for your new assignment is in Artemis's wing, and I do believe it began about... And she raises her wrist... Uh, up to her eyeline, even though there's no watch. Ten minutes ago. So you best hurry. Lumira hears ten minutes ago and is already standing up out of her chair. I appreciate every opportunity and risk you took on me, Hand Lucy. Mm. Trust in her will. Um, and Lumira will calmly walk out of the door and as soon as the door slams you just hear those heels beelining just clack 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 directly towards artemis's yep direction (laughs) you book it down the corridor and on that i think as lucy's office door slams shut we cut to artemis's office
It stands in complete stark contrast to Lucy's lavish den. This is a tastefully decorated space with deep emeralds, muted golds, rich browns. A viewing bay reveals a dark forest currently swaddled in mist and rain. Sayer, Sing, and Zynan, the three of you sit across a wooden desk from Artemis, who is currently going over some paperwork with a pen. There is an empty seat next to Sayer as the three of you wait for your fourth and final assigned strike team member to arrive, who is 10 minutes tardy. And the silence in this office as you wait, heavy, awkward. Sing is tapping her fingers on her knees, like humming a little tune in her throat. And then she kind of like turns to Zynan with a bright smile and finally breaks the quiet. So, Zynan Esh, right? Big fan, huge fan here. The star of LSSG, wow. Uh, pleasure to make your acquaintance. You're the chosen, uh, Chosen of Fate Sing, Oh, right? shucks. Yes, that is me. Chosen of Fate Sing. This is my brother. Say your, say your, say hi. Howdy. Oh, oh, Zion. Sir. Uh, pleasure. The, the sir kind of hits him like someone slapped him on the cheek a little bit, but he just kind of takes it, sits there a little stunned. Hmm. Clack, 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 uh, clack, 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 clack. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and steady, walking into the office, cool, calm, and collected. And thank God you do, Lumira, because Singh was in the middle of saying to Zainan, uh, I've always looked up to you. You know, obviously I've never gone to LSSG because I'm not a lone survivor, you know. But um, um I, I would love to go one day. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't love to go. I mean, I just... Huh. um. Uh, sing, sing. Exit strategy, exit strategy now. Exit. Uh, Zenith okay. has been staring at Artemis's desk pretty much this whole time before Sing started talking to him. And he has gone back to that, just trying to like nod, nod. And then he hears the clacking at the door and he turns his head like, oh, thank God, an interruption that is not this. Lumi! Oh my God! Lumi! <gasps> You're, are you? <gasps> Agent Lumira. <clears throat> Lucy may run on her own schedule, but I do expect my teams to be prompt. My apologies. And Artemis, I am... Um... And Lumira looks... Once again, mask on facade as if she's trying to keep it together, but you know her. You can tell she's one left turn away from a spiral. <laughs> uh, and it's just like, it will not happen again. Agent Singh, say here. Mira, it's good to see you. Uh, Agent I Mira? go by Lumira now. Understood. The mirror. And um, Sayer's taken a little bit aback for a moment, but he quiets down. And Artemis's eyes kind of finally pull up from the paper to look at you, the mirror, for real. And she gives you a once over the same way that she gave everyone who walked into her, her office a scathing close one over. And her eyes rest kind of uh, on your hip. And a little tiny smile peeks out of the corner of her mouth. <sighs> I do expect it's... you to be prompt, especially if you're carrying a timepiece on you. But you get the feeling that she's teasing you. There's something soft to the edge uh, as she stands up behind her desk, rolls those broad shoulders behind, slides the paper toward you and says... Come in, sit down. It's time for your first mission brief. Number 92344112. Aldemura. And on that, 
we cut to Ald Amura. It is a vast, beautiful plain brimming with magic and might. We sweep past rolling hills of lava, chasms strung with steel chains, verdant wood, <clears throat> excuse me, verdant woodlands, submerged cities of light, towers of yellow red pelagonite, mountains gleaming with precisely carved reflective domes to find far in the north at the end of the old king's path, the quaint townlet of Petrus Mall. Stately log cabins stand in contrast to luminescent pink and gold crystals that sprout from the earth, peeking through dense layers of snow like spring's first bloom. The people of Petrus Mall are hardy and hale. They are known for being winter survivalists, expert carpenters, and the preeminent voice on log cabin architecture. Just a mile beyond this village, the iron woods lean against the base of the Ander Petrus mountain range. But not even these toothy woods can ward travelers from reaching Petrus Mall, intent on learning about carpentry, survival, or crystal crafting. That is, until the false gold came. You see, Aldemura was once a plane of harmony. Monsters and humans lived in peace. Humans cared for monsters, providing food and shelter, while monsters lent their power, magic, and might to humanity. All was well for a thousand years. The world prospered. War was a thing of the past. And then, tragedy struck. First, in the grand city of Tenaris Mall, an elder wyvern's rage laid waste to the city, leaving thousands displaced. And then, in the cliff towns of the Twin Snakes, the Great New shattered its glass peaks, and it was only through the rapid and fearless work of the city's monsters that disaster was averted. Top monster researchers went to work and discovered a terrible fact. The Elder Wyvern and the New were cursed with a deadly poison, one that inflicted horrible wounds and sent monsters into an uncontrollable rage. The origins of this poison are unknown, but its effects are everywhere. And in time, it came to be known as the False Gold, due to the shiny, viscous fluid produced by the curse's wounds. The peace between humans and monsters is now uneasy. Monsters are afraid of succumbing to this curse. Humans are afraid of losing their homes. The delicate balance that once characterized Aldemura is on the brink of collapse. This world's only hope are monster care specialists. Brave, strong, intelligent people who dedicate their lives to helping the cursed monsters of Aldemura recover from their affliction. But this is not a story about a monster care specialist. This is a story about a parent who has lost one. Medea, you have lived in Petrus Mall your entire life, as your parents did before you, and their parents did before them. You're used to the cold, to the crystals, to the silent snowfall in the morning and the warm fireside conversations at night. You're used to chopping firewood. You're used to frostbite. You're used to blizzards. What you're not used to, what no one in Petrus Mall is used to, from the wrinkle-faced elders to the strong-backed youth, is the twelve year storm. When the false gold descended twelve years ago, so too did a blizzard upon Petrus Mall. At first the people here thought nothing of it. I mean, snowstorms are very common. And besides, Poca Poca, the monster guardian of Petrus Mall, would always lead lost souls back to safety. The blizzard persisted a day, then a week, then a month, then a year. Those who ventured into the blizzard seeking help from monster care specialists never came back. And Poca Poca, the beacon of the lost, 
was nowhere to be found. Today marks the twelfth year, fifth month, and eighth day of the twelve-year storm, and every year, Medea, it's gotten worse. At first, it surrounded the outskirts of the Iron Woods, dowsing the Ander Petrus mountain range in thick flurries that could swallow buildings, but it was far away enough from the village to not be a real threat. But by now, over the course of over a decade, it's closed in to threaten Petrus Mall itself. It grows stronger by the month, the week, the day, the storm is getting worse, and Poca Poca still is nowhere to be found. The people whisper, they have always whispered, that Poca Poca has been cursed by the false gold. That instead of leading lost souls back home, he now takes them deeper into the blizzard, into unknown and terrible dooms, lost forever in the cold. Medea, you are in the midst of an important activity, preparing for a vital sojourn. Where in Petra Small do we find you? What do you look like? And what are you doing? I... Medea has a hulking, curvy frame. Muscular and towering, but they pull in on themselves. You can see that their shoulders are sloped, their head bowed, perhaps weighed down by their full canvas backpack, perhaps weighed down by something else. As they are working alongside another person who lives here in Petra Small, they are currently shoveling snow away from this person's home. This is an activity that they have to do several times during the day, especially as the storm has gotten worse. To stop this would mean getting snowed in, and to get snowed in would only lead to something terrible. Green crystals twinkle with every movement that Medea makes hanging from their backpack, suspended by twine. Most notably on their person is an unusually deep circular shield strapped to their backpack. An uneven copper face with a charred heart, like a black sun ringed on a metal dish. There's snow softly dusting down on her soft, downy, tufted ears. There's periwinkle fur across their forehead, across their nose, bits of their fingers, and it ends in a renarium set between sleepy, doe-like eyes. All the things on Medea's person look like they've taken time to make. They're not made particularly well or masterfully, but it looks like it's made with purpose and care. Between heavy layers, there's a knitted sweater woven of many different types of fur and hair, roughly handcrafted. And there are several belts slung over their hips, low, high, tight, loose, from which several vials and pouches hang heavy and full. Some of them crunch with every motion of digging the shovel. Crunch, tossing it to the side. As we finish, Medea leans back. Well, I think that's as good as we're going to get it for now. If you don't mind, I believe we agreed if with a little bit of help there that perhaps you'd give me something to eat to take with me. I've run out of rations in my home. Oh, absolutely, Medea. A anything for you. And the person who had enlisted your help is a village elder who... Over the years, it's gotten harder and harder for them to shovel the snow of their own accord, especially as the blizzard's gotten worse. You know them as Zitu. They are a uh, hunchback person. They're leaning on a cane right now, a cane that their son carved for them, the son being one of the local woodcarvers of Petrus Mall. They themselves are a crystal crafter. And you see a set of beady amber eyes set between a, a long beak as they are a bird-like person with these uh, bright white feathers that blend in with the snow gusting down around both of you. The front door to their home is open. They'd insisted on it being open uh, as they looked over your work, uh, very worried that you might slip on a patch of black ice. And they say, yes, yes, let's, certainly, let's Medea. get inside. You don't want the heat please. to escape. Yes, please do. Uh, I'll call my son. He's... Uh, that... Damn fool, he's gone out to the inner skirts of the Iron Woods to fetch a bit more lumber. I told him we could make do with what we have. I don't want him going out into the cold and... P poca Poca might t 
take him. A heavy sigh leaves Medea. There's hesitance that strings before they say, do you want me to go look for them? I, uh, I... I can call no, them for no. you. Well, if it's... If it's not too much trouble on your way out... Matea, are you really quite sure this is a good idea? I'll supply you with as many rations as you need, but... Well, Petra's Mall, we need you now more than ever. And no one who goes out, really out, ever comes back. Medea looks down to her boots. She's stomped them as much as she could to try to get the snow off, but there's always more snow. She says without looking up, It's been eight years. I think it's time. Well, I know that when you have your mind set to something, Medea, there is no persuading you from it, like a river that must run its course. Well, just wait right here. I'll bring you your rations. And a little bit of extra something for all the help that you've rendered us over the years. Thank you. And I'll be back to help. You best be back. If anyone can be back, it'll be you. As they turn to leave and gather the things, Medea reaches forward and tries to give them a nice little pat on the back, but it's a little... they're very muscular. Just a little too rough. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm okay. It's cool. <coughs> I'm fine. I'm good. Uh, and Z2 goes deeper into their own log cabin home with the door slightly cracked open, the warmth billowing against your face, though you are nice and warmed up from doing the manual hard labor of shoveling the snow. And it is at this moment that I must ask, Zainan, Lumira, Sayer, how do you burst onto the scene, interrupting Medea's preparations, completely ruining what they've been trying to do? Oh no. Yikes. That's I think... A... <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think you just did such beautiful work shoveling all the snow. And um, we don't know exactly how we're going to land when we land on a new plane. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when Zynan straightens up, because he doesn't jump or any of the many 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 variations in which agents experience transplanar you know travel uh, he just steps and he steps from Artemis's office wearing nice heavy heeled gold toed cowboy boots into a person height mound of snow that immediately cracks underneath just his weight, let alone the strike team that is seconds, microseconds away, uh, and we collapse all of hey, that shovel snow. Pushing. You quit pushing! Whoa. And I think with that, like, Singh pushes Sayer, Sayer pushes Zaiden straight into the mound, and, like, Sayer also falls, like, right on top of you, but, but tries to stay himself. Lumira is the boy. <laughs> Lumira is the one that actually sticks the landing and is directly <laughs> in the middle of the snowbank while her companions fall face first into the heap. Uh, and she just looks around and goes, I, the cold planets. <laughs> <laughs> so that is just a pile of black fabric in this <laughs> pile of snow. He has fully fallen ass first onto the snow. Uh, I'll get up. 
Hold on. Sayer's face and... <laughs> burst into the snow. There's an antler-shaped indentation into the snow pile. Uh, Lumira's <laughs> hand just sticks in the pile and just for anyone's hand to pull them out. Like, Sing, take... No, Sayer might try, but Sing grabs it first and you, like, pull her out of the snow. Even though she landed rather ungracefully, she surfaces like a beautiful mermaid breaching through a wave, right? And the snow... Her dislodging from the bank shoves Zainan and Seir like an avalanche down into this beautifully cleared path that Medea had just shoveled and all the snow comes pouring down, sending Zainan and Seir tumbling with it, destroying your masterpiece. Lumira think... notices none of that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> At the sound of noises, voices, one of Medea's long furry ears twitches in their direction, but Medea waits and minds their own business, but at the sound of the crash, they flinch a little and then begin to step outside, peeking their head out. Um, yeah. Hello? <laughs> you finally see the antler individual stick it, like, fully get up, like, snow covering all of him and, like, taking all over his antlers. And as he, his face is covered in snow, blows it out of his mouth, and he tries to stand up and extends an arm over to Zainan. Very, very tentatively, he, Zainan reaches his, like, heavily gloved, like, extremely plush gloved hand up to take yours. It, it, the Sayer's hand like shakes for a moment as it reaches over to you, but he does grip tightly and you do feel that strength as he like holds himself steady to pull you up. Thank uh, you. And uh, he's like, uh, no, no, no problem, sir. Um, apologies, uh, my bad. Hello? Hello? Uh, where did you come from? We, uh, just blew in, it would seem. There is very obvious concern on Medea's features. She looks around, trying to see if there's some caravan or wagon or anything, but nothing. No one stays outside for very long for any good reason. Um, no, and... More crucially, Medea, no outsiders have come to Petrus Mall in over a decade. Uh, um, we are midst a blizzard. There have been no one, no people to have come to Petrus Mall since it began. What? Um, reaches uh. forward and just brushes snow off of one of you. <laughs> We're, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think then, like, Sayer feels that, like, tentative awkwardness, uh, and he, uh, notices that you, like, reach out to him to, like, brush snow off. He's like, no, no, don't worry about it, I'll do it. And as he pats the snow off of himself, you begin to see underneath the caked snow, his eyes widen a little bit in slight astonishment. The black and gold robes are now a furred cloak tied asymmetrically draped over his shoulders made out of woven almost bear-like fur that drapes over his shoulders and underneath it leather armor that is uh, held together by a thick leather pauldron on his uh, one side of his body and tightens down to thick trousers and very very practical hefty boots. Underneath that, as he's brushing the snow off, you begin to actually notice the peeking out from underneath the wraps of his gauntlets, gold markings peeking out of his forearms. His antlers are tinged in gold, and his tattoo or mark on his chest, something akin to a dark moon, bright gold and shimmering amidst the white of the snow. It's Im almost impossible to miss. And as he like dusts all the snow off, he's like, oh, I think we just um, 
and got turned around. Uh, where, uh, where is this? You are in Petrus Mall. This is a crystal grove in the north. I, I, I'm Say here. My name is Sayer, and these are my friends. Hello. Howdy. Uh, my name is Zainan. And Zainan, uh, as he says that, he has finally dusted off what he thinks is the last of the snow. It is not. Um, and he has put on a uh, hat that the inner brim of this flat brimmed black hat is now fully lined in like a heavy thick knit that is reminiscent of shearing but it is again that like thick knit fabric um and he straightens up and he also has uh instead of his traditional like long draping shawl he has a uh heavy cloak that has a heavy deep cowl neck that it sits over a quilted jacket that has more of that shearing inside of it. And he offers a hand out to you, Medea. Without hesitation, Medea takes it and shakes it, looking more bewildered at just the presence <laughs> of the three of you than the specific details of you. Um, I am Medea, and who might you be? gesturing over to the final squad member. Um, Lumira looks the most calm and collected while everyone else is gathering their bearings and dusting themselves off of the snow. What happens with Lumira is she dusts herself off as well too from the reminiscent, but in the midst of her swiping off her shoulders, um, her regular cloaks that are these very tight form fitting, sharp angled, especially up at the shoulders um, and covered in these gold clock gears. Um, what happens is it looks like it turns into like the nicest wool coat that you could possibly imagine, um, but it also has a hood that has fur that's trimmed around the edges and fur that's around the bells of her sleeves and also around um, the end of her cloaks as well that kind of brush against the snow as she walks. Still her signature uh, thigh boots, but instead of them being just like clacky dress boots these look like winter boots like they're supposed to be worn for like hiking through outside but you know with a little extra glam and flair because this is your girl um and she kind of just clears the rest of the snow that's like filtering around the hood of her coat um <clears throat> and reaches out her hand to yours as well grabs it very firmly very sternly quick two shakes and let's go lumira it's a pleasure to meet you and medea's handshake is warm it's soft her fingers squish within your grip very easily she doesn't resist it she looks down at your your clothes did you did you make that that's it's very lovely. Um, I made this, <laughs> um, but it's not quite as nice as yours. If it is yours and it keeps you warm, it is nice. Thank you. Um, are you hungry? Um, you m must have come a very long way to be here. Um, uh, we're um, actually looking for something and finally Zainan gestures kind of like calling Sing and Lumira over to kind of like all be together and you can see underneath his cloak a long white what looks like stock of a gun but it is white like the snow it is matte and on the stock of it right near where it would rest against his shoulder you can see the uh, green 
symbol of uh, an aid cross, marking him as someone who cares for the creatures of this world. Mm. Medea, you, you recognize this implement instantly. It looks exactly like something a monster care specialist might carry. And taking in these people who blew in from nowhere, uh, it seems very likely that they might be a monster care squad, which have been people that the folks of Petrus Mall have been trying to reach for over a decade, but gave up a long time ago. And as this final member of this presumably monster care squad strides forward we all see sing who also has like a fur lined uh, cloak on it's a long black cloak lined with this bright white wild fur almost like her hair and as she like puts her hood down she gasps and looks down at her hair it's short it's cropped like a bob uh with these like short white wisps around her ears and that long white cloak fluttering out from behind her <gasps> as she seems uh, for an instant in a, a stroke of much-deserved vanity, she turns around in the snow and looks at herself. Otherwise, looks very similar to Sayira's garb with hides and pelts and furs uh, for her, like, armor. <gasps> oh my goodness! Sayir! Sign in, Lumira! Sayir leads in, he's like, that's you. Uh, and he, like, touches <sighs> Sing's hair uh, and looks at, <clears throat> and looks at her ears. The f oh. one time you actually see Lumira in the line of anything actually show emotion, <laughs> jaw, like you can hear like the eh, eh, of like just the hinges all the way down, just. Um, uh, ha! Huh, and starts brushing snow off of her. <laughs> oh. I'm so sorry about that. Yes, back to the matter at hand. Hello, I'm Sing. I'm Sayer's twin sister. Uh, we are members of a monster care. That's what that's what Armis said, right? Monster care yes. squad. Yes. Medea has been quiet throughout this exchange, throughout this introduction. Seems to appreciate that there's some kind of gravita here. But upon being directly addressed, oh yes, oh yes, yes, you you're finally here. Um, we've been waiting. We've been sending out missives and messages trying to get you here. Perhaps you can help me. Yes. I believe yeah, that's what absolutely. we're here to do. A hundred percent. My intention to go into the iron, but to see if I can find something, um, anything really to do with this blizzard. You, hold on, what did you say your name was again? Medea. And a look of recognition, oh. yep, falls over all of them. Oh, that's what, that's what Artemis said, right? That's what the hand said, mm -hmm. our objective. Mm. Yes, is this thing that you're looking for, uh, does it go by the name Poca Poca, by any instance? Medea's eyebrows raise, yes, so, oh, you must have gotten the message, wonderful. We are in desperate need of help. Begins to gesture over towards the various homes here. We've been stuck for over a decade in the heart of this storm. We are trying to make do with what supplies that we have, our means of self-sustaining, but the storm is only getting worse and worse. It is good that you are finally here. How would you like us to assist? Well, I will have to admit that I'm not an expert in any such thing, but I figured it's time to try. Looking kind of hesitantly back through the door crack, seeing if uh, a Z2 has appeared or not. Right on schedule, Z2 kind of like uh, clacks over on their taloned feet, uh, holding a big pouch of rations, as well as a smaller pouch of what smell very strongly like medicinal herbs. Ah, just a couple small things I was able to forage a couple years back. I was able to dry them out from the winter rot. Mm -hmm. And here are some rations and... Oh, Medea. <clears throat> Medea, don't look now, but there are strangers behind you. There are outsiders. Has, has the blizzard it's, lessened? No, it's the monster care squad. <gasps> They're finally Almost here. Almost even better. 
Excellent! Oh, hello, monster care specialists! Please, Howdy. please help us! You must help us! Poka Poka has taken so many of us! We need them returned! Please! Oh, and if you see my son out there, his name is Urahi. Tell him to come home, please. I'm starting to get worried. Yeah. We will do everything yes. in our power. Thank you. Oh, thank you! A glorious, beauteous day! I knew praying to the ancestors would work. I knew it, Medea! Mm -hmm. Begins to shoulder off their heavy backpack puts it down as they open it you can see that there is an assortment of cooking supplies there's uh various utensils as well but noticeably there is also a single book and they sort of shove it back to make space for the rations stuffs them in and begins to shoulder it back on All right um well it is my intention to seek out c2's sun and see what else we can find out there how long Please. ago did your son depart oh, earlier today he said he was going to chop firewood he's usually back by now the blizzard closes in every week it feels every day it gets closer and closer to our village be careful out there Medea can tell you show you the parts that are dangerous the parts that are charted the parts that are unknown but it gets stronger every day I fear he might have gotten lost and if he's lost then then Poka Poka must have him. Where someone might offer some sympathy or empathetic gesture to Z2 here, Medea just looks at the floor and doesn't say anything. Hmm. When... Zainan sees Medea look to the ground next to him and just lets out a very heavy sigh seeing that there is more to this world than just the monsters and the fact that it's, you know, a level four uh, plane and all of the things that we were just briefed on, there are still people in every plane. We'll uh, do our best. Thank you. Well, if anyone can do it, if anyone can help Medea, Find Poka Poka and and bring our our community back home. It will be Monster Care Specialists set a Monster Care Squad. Had I I knew praying would work. I I I knew the fates would listen. Reaches forward and does another pat, a little too strong. Um, no. our, we'll be on our way. Uh, let's let's go. Mm. Ushers the others out as uh, Medea closes the door behind her securely. Mm. Right. And as the door and as the door closes and a final flurry of snow washes across each of your faces, you turn toward the direction of the iron woods, your eyes cast on the journey ahead. And on that, we're going to cut to break. Uh, so everyone enjoy the 10 minutes. Make sure to join the giveaway if you haven't already yet. All you got to do is sign up for Sandy Pug Games mailing list and use hashtag monster in chat. The prizes are going to be excellent. We're going to draw them at the end of the stream. Uh, see you in 10 minutes. Take a break. Shpijo, bijo. Hey, hey, it's Connie from Transplaner RPG. If you like the idea of helping monsters rather than hunting them, check out Monster Care Squad by Sandy Pug Games. Play as a monster care specialist, helping the majestic monsters of Aldamura who are suffering from the false gold, a vile poison that sends them into uncontrollable rages. Solve local problems, explore a sprawling world, and help the beautiful and strange creatures that share your home. Monster Care Squad is available through Sandy Pug Games, as well as their first official expansion, Behind the Waterfall, featuring three new monsters, two new locations, and dozens of moves, wounds, and lore nuggets. Sandy Pug also publishes The Exquisite Corpse in Maggot's Keep, a gamebook where you embody a beautiful skeleton exploring a bizarre and gothic world. You'll bounce from writer to writer, style to style, like listening to your friends tell stories around a campfire. To learn more about Sandy Pug's weird and wonderful games, sign up for their mailing list at bit.ly slash spgtransplainer. Plus, use Transplainer at checkout for 20% off any order at Sandy Pug Games. Check out their offerings at sandypuggames.com and nab a copy of Monster Care Squad or The Exquisite Corpse at Maggot's Keep for yourself today.
Ha, <laughs> ha,